Today, I am delighted to have as our guest on the 27th episode of my podcast, Authentically Debs, Dr. Marissa T. Mazza, a licensed psychologist, supervisor, and founder of Choice Therapy, which is a group practicing evidence-based treatments for OCD and anxiety. Dr. Maza is passionate about providing evidence-based therapies such as cognitive behavioral therapy, exposure and response prevention or ERP, acceptance and commitment therapy, and mindful self-compassion to teens and adults struggling with OCD or anxiety. She provides supervision and consultation to other professionals as well, such as faculty at the International OCD Foundation's Behavioral Therapy Training Institute and at the University of San Francisco. She has also published the ACD Workbook for OCD. That's Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Workbook for OCD. So as you can tell, she is a very busy professional, and I'm just so grateful that she's taken the time to be with us today. So welcome. Well, I'm so glad you are here, and may I call you Marissa? You can call me Marissa. Yeah, Marisa. that's my first name. Yes. <laughs> much better. I love that. And, and uh, I'm Deborah. And um, well, you know, your, your introduction um, precedes you. Um, there's so many things I want to ask you. I know that you are a, a fabulous therapist. Uh, you specialize in OCD and anxiety. And actually, OCD kind of comes under the umbrella of anxiety anyway, right? You know, that's a good question. And, and there is some um, difference of opinion uh, when it comes to this area. The 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 book that, that psychologists use to help diagnose individuals um, that breaks dif- disorders out, um, OCD used to be under the category of anxiety disorders, but in the most recent revision, they actually gave OCD a completely separate category. Um, And while I understand why there's many aspects of OCD that are different than than some of the other anxiety disorders, um, it can be a little bit confusing for folks, but- I think uh, it is different. I'm I'm glad they've made that distinction. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, typically OCD will include intrusive, unwanted thoughts that are associated with either anxiety or disgust um, and compulsions. Um, and, and the compulsions can be either mental behaviors or physical behaviors. And, and both of them, the obsessions and or compulsions need to be taking up at least a, an hour of the person's time. To be considered OCD. To be considered OCD. Yeah. So it does Uh, feel in many ways for folks different than an anxiety disorder because in a lot of other anxiety disorders, the person's not necessarily engaged in some of these uh, compulsions. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. I I think that you hit it. That's a, that's one of the big differences. (laughs) Um, Okay. Well, what I was, what I was getting at is that, um, you're, you're married. You have one child. Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's congratulations. Thank and, you. Um, I have my first great grandchild. Wow. Congratulations. And uh, it's been <laughs> such a long time since we've had a baby in the family and I'm, I'm just totally in love. Um, yeah. two months, I'm not sure how long this will last, but probably forever. Um, how did you come about being interested in uh, just as a person in the field of psychology and then specifically in OCD and anxiety? Yeah, so um, in high school, psychology was the only class 
I didn't mind going to. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah. we I fell in love with it. God. Yeah. I fell in love with it um, in high school. I, I really was fascinated and, and interested by it. Um, I think a part of that interest came from um, having family members with uh, different types of, of mental health problems um, and me also experiencing some of my own anxiety. I was always curious and wanting to learn more about the mind, wanting to learn more about emotions. And so there was that natural kind of curiosity. And when I went to college, I was one of those dorks that said, I know I want to major in psychology from the get-go. And it's great. I'm sure it's great that you knew that. <laughs> Yeah. And, and the more I learned, um, the more interested I, I became and, and I, I love what I do. I really do. I feel very lucky, um, and, and blessed to, to be in a position of, um, being able to share information. And that's why I was so excited when you asked me to do this podcast, because, um, you know, I've, I've gone through a lot of schooling. I've been lucky enough to meet some of the world's best anxiety and OCD therapist. And well, I'm, I'm not learned... sure it was all luck uh, because I've, uh, in reading your bio, it's just uh, not only do you treat patients, but you also, um, you also counsel professionals, you know, in, in so many different ways. Um, you know, you mentioned you knew exactly what you wanted to do. And, you, you know, I'm a retired teacher, just getting back into the arts and you know they never gave us um that they, they never gave us courses on the brain or how that or how behavior connected and I, I taught special education for god's sake um I mean there just there just wasn't enough of that I'm I'm sure there must be a lot more of it now but oh my goodness uh because in teaching incarcerated youth which I did uh, I had PTSD, bipolar. That was my special ed. It wasn't intellectually challenged. Uh, a lot of these kids were behind, but that's because they didn't go to school until they were locked up. But I'm not going <laughs> to get on that. Um, let's see. You have given uh, a really already you've given a good definition of OCD. Um, I, I kind of get perturbed sometimes because people tend to make jokes about it, you know, like, oh, that's my OCD. Well, maybe you have an OCD personality, but do you really have OCD, which is a very dangerous mental illness? Um, I'm a sufferer, and um, the first year of my podcast was my memoir, the through line of which was my suffering with OCD up until my early 50s, when I finally diagnosed myself and got confirmation. Um, may I ask, are you a sufferer of OCD? No. I don't have OCD, no. Um, I have definitely struggled with some of my own general anxiety and have experienced some obsessions. Um, but my uh, main compulsion, if you will, would be worry. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I don't meet the criteria, at least in my opinion, I don't meet the criteria for OCD, but I, I, I know what it feels like to have extreme anxiety. Yeah. Um, and to be caught up in, in a whole lot of worrying. I do have family members that struggle with OCD. And so I, I do. Yeah. And, um, and you're right. I mean, there is a lot uh, that is portrayed out there, even in the media um, about OCD being this like fun thing. Everyone and thinks they know what it is, you know? Right, right. Absolutely. And in reality, I mean, people don't enjoy having OCD, right? Like it's it's a disorder for the for a reason. It gets in the way of people Perfectly. being able to live them lives, live their lives, also just be themselves, be authentic in relationships. And so, um, when people are engaging in compulsions, it's it's suffering. They don't want to be doing. It. They don't want to be caught up in these mental loops or engaged in these repetitive behaviors. It causes great distress. And so absolutely, it's, it's, it's not a laughing matter and it, it needs to be taken more, more seriously. Is it, because I had read a few years ago that it was uh, one of the three major mental illnesses. It was schizophrenia, bipolar, and OCD. Is that still the case? Um, you know, to be honest with you, it's been a while since I, I've looked at that survey, but um, it's still, I mean, 
if you could, it is, you know, in some ways still considered an anxiety disorder. And, um, and if you look at some of the leading causes uh, that leading contributors to uh, disability, it's, it's right up there, I believe, within the top five. And so, I, I mean, it, I would it's- I think so. I would definitely think Absolutely, so. absolutely. Um, I think we all think of, of Howard Hughes, as I do, as having OCD. He had a cleanliness obsession and it, it ended up killing him, right? I mean, is that, is, that, are, is that your thinking on that? You know, I don't know, to be honest with you. I'm not sure because I, you know, I wasn't his therapist and, and no, I don't have, <laughs> yeah, I don't have a really, I don't have a, I don't have a, a clear sense of, of what happened in that, in that scenario. But I think, um, you know, not everyone with OCD, you know, leads to, you know, harming yeah. in any, in any way, like, you know, um, in fact, you know, a lot of my clients, although they may experience um, what feels like dangerous thoughts, mm -hmm. um, in, in actuality, the fact that they have guilt or anxiety about these thoughts um, tells us that they're, they're, they're not, the, the chances of them acting on those serious things are, are less likely. Uh, although obviously, if anyone has thoughts about wanting to harm themselves, um, it needs to be taken seriously and support needs to be provided. Yes, most definitely. Um, I want you to go over, if you will, um, some of the treatments that um, that I mentioned in introducing you. Um, you mentioned um, cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy. Um, can you give us a short definition of that? Because I think I know what that is. And I think I've yeah. had but sure sure there's a there's you know there's a few different types of evidence-based therapies for OCD um the the two main ones that I focus on are exposure and response prevention as well as act acceptance and commitment therapy that um, is very interesting yeah yes yeah we we love our acronyms in psychology and so um you exposure, wrote a book about it right yes yeah yeah so um you know, um, exposure and response prevention has had been a treatment that had been around quite a while, and it's been shown to be very helpful for folks with anxiety. It includes slowly and gradually exposing the person to what it is they're fearful from of, um, mm -hmm. and act acceptance and commitment therapy. Although it has been around for a while, um, it. it it's more recent in terms of its um, more more uh, popular, if you will. Uh, application to OCD. And while uh, they're similar in a lot of ways, acceptance and commitment therapy is also an exposure-based treatment where you're helping people practice uh, encountering the things that, it, that they're fearful of. Uh, in my opinion, ACT does a really great job of also teaching people what to do when they're not engaged in the compulsion. Um, learning how to have, right, right, learning how to have uncomfortable thoughts and emotions is a really hard thing to do yeah, and so to live with this uncertainty it's like ugh. yeah and that's exactly in my opinion what act adds to it is it really helps people learn how to live right if they're not spending so much time on their ocd what would they be focused on right. and I've yeah been reading some of some of the reviews of your book and um one thing that really kept coming up was um, was the uh, uh, maybe it's empathetic, but but the empathy, um, you know, the uh, the compassion of the book, and that's so important. People showing others empathy, um, yeah. showing yourself empathy. Um, yeah. So I, I was very impressed. Yeah, I'm going to get that. you mentioned. You mentioned, uh, you know, we talked about earlier that, you know, OCD is not a, uh, it's not a joyful, fun experience. It's actually quite distressing. And a lot of people uh, with OCD not only experience anxiety, but they also experience this component of shame. And sometimes it's because of, you know, maybe certain types of thoughts they experience. Other times um, it's just because they, they don't understand why they continue to engage in compulsions, right? And so um, in so working with a lot of- with excuse me, it may have to do with other people, but it may have to just do with themselves. 
right? Correct. Yeah. So, so when I think about what self-compassion is, right, it's, it's really about recognizing that we all have an inner critic, right? Like we all have a part of ourselves that basically says like, what's wrong with you? You should be bigger. You should, should be more, you shouldn't be having obsessions or you shouldn't be having these experiences or you shouldn't be engaging in compulsions. And what I noticed is for a lot of the clients that I work with, you know, sometimes when they slipped up and engaged in compulsions or they had these difficult experiences, you know, it resulted in them spending so much time in beating themselves up. Yeah. And so, which isn't helpful either, right? And so um, a big part of what I tried to do throughout the book and I do in practice as well is help people learn how to be with difficult experiences, but in a kinder way, actually learning how to treat themselves as though they were a friend. Uh, and um, teaching, you know, compassion. I use um, Dr. Kristen Neff and Dr. Chris Germer's mindful self-compassion model um, in my own personal practice, as well as with my clients. And there's a lot of research to support how it's been helpful for a lot of folks with different types of anxieties and particularly folks with shame. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I'm just trying to think of myself and did I experience much shame? Um, I don't know that that necessarily applies to me, but that's why I was so, so interested in that. I wanted to mention something, you know, we need hours here, but <laughs> um, I had, I, I noted, well, for example, Howard Hughes, again, it, it seemed to just, some people just stay with one obsession. For me, I, I tended to jump from one to another to another with different compulsions to go along with those obsessions. I definitely had scrupulosity and which was very dangerous for me. And then I also had trichotillomania. Um, I don't even know if you recall, cause you're quite young, but 15 or 20 years ago, a woman in Houston, Texas killed her five children and um, definitely was mentally ill. She was originally, have you heard of that by chance? Probably. I, I have, yes, yeah. So she was, I think, originally found guilty and was put in prison. And then there was a retrial and now she's in uh some type of mental institution, which is where she should be. But I kept noticing as they would show her that she had big blotches of baldness. And, and I'm not sure all she had was OCD, but I think OCD, I'll just ask you, can, can that cross over into psychosis? So it's, it's a good question. I mean, for, for the vast majority of people with OCD, um, it, it, it doesn't. Um, neurotic. Yeah, for, yeah, for the vast majority of, of folks with OCD, it, you know, it doesn't. Psychosis is really a, sort of a separate piece of it. Well, I'm not and, saying that that's all she had was OCD, but she definitely right. did have that or she had. Right. Yeah. What, what you're describing in trichotillomania, it's, um, it's considered a body focused repetitive behavior. And so um, a lot of people with OCD do also experience hair pulling or skin picking and that's, um, a, and that's a that's a body um, a body focused repetitive behavior sometimes it's directly related to the ocd so for example sometimes will people will will pull in response to an obsession or an uncomfortable feeling um, but other times it's not related to ocd really so okay. so people can have hair pulling and not necessarily have ocd um, but the, the part I want to highlight here, just so folks, you know, are, do know and aware that, that folks with OCD are, are one of the least likely people to harm other people. Um, and so I just, you know, want to make, make that really, really clear. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very good point. And I'm, I'm going to shut up enough to let you emphasize that because that is so important, but the, the tricky, it, it's still so tricky for me for OCD is that you you really that's why I mentioned psychosis partly because like I can remember having to drive around the block I hit some kind of a bump and I thought oh my god I've hit a person and so I would drive around the block now I don't think I really thought I'd hit that person 
But the fact that I drove around the block more than once, uh, I mean, maybe not more than once that day, but things like that would happen for me. Um, that's kind of, that it's, it's, it's a crazy disorder that's not really psychotic necessarily because you I mean, know to, that you're going to do it anyway. Right, right. And so I think that's a really good point because that's fairly common to me. It doesn't sound crazy. It sounds like OCD. So a lot of people with OCD do recognize that it's not rational. They'll yeah. recognize it's not rational. It's not sensical. And yet I continue to repeat it. And, the, you know, the thing that I want to emphasize here is that OCD is considered a brain and behavioral disorder, right? Okay. And so there are differences in serotonin. There's differences in the structural parts of the brain within OCD, making it more likely for people to experience unwanted thoughts and urges and to engage in repetitive behaviors. Um, but, and, and that's actually one of the things that differentiates them from psychosis. Whereas a person with schizophrenia may not even recognize it's irrational. That's true. And that's, that's also kind of why I was asking you, if I know it's untrue, then why do I have to do that? Do it. And why do I have to go back around the corner? I mean, well, let me ask you this question, right? When you have that thought of, I may have run someone over and you drive around the corner to check, what does that do to the anxiety in the short term? It, it helps it. Exactly, exactly. And so people ask me this question all the time, like I'm doing these compulsions. I know that like I shouldn't be doing them, but yet I keep doing them. What's wrong with me? And I say, it totally makes sense. You're doing it because it works. In the short term, engaging in compulsions, driving around the, the corner, washing your hands, even doing some of the mental repetitive behaviors, in the short term, it actually helps reduce the anxiety. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's why folks do compulsions or avoidance. For some people, it's having a glass of wine, right? And, and for others with OCD, it's about engaging in a compulsion, right? Mm -hmm. And it works. That's why people do it. In the short term, it relieves the anxiety. The problem is that in the long term, if the majority of one's time is spent on avoidance, right? That means that less of their time is being spent on the things that they actually value, the things that give them meaning. And the other problem is that although it gives relief in the short term, in the long term, it doesn't necessarily make the obsessions, the anxiety, the doubt go away. No, and then you, know, you to think, does everyone function like this? Right. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, and so the cost of continuing to get, engage in repetitive behaviors, compulsions and avoidance the majority of the time is the person never really learns how to have the discomfort and uncertainty. So, and that's a lot of what, you know, exposure and response prevention and acceptance and commitment therapy, that's what they do is really help people learn how to have the discomfort, so how to have quickly, the experiences while living. Okay, I want you to tell us how exactly to get that book, that workbook. Um, so um, I, I wrote the ACT workbook for OCD yes. and you, it's, you can purchase it through Amazon. Okay. Yeah. And it includes what I tried to do in that book was really marry exposure and response prevention with, ex with acceptance and commitment therapy and include some self-compassion because I feel like it's all three of those components that really help folks learn how to have their difficult experiences while living a big, beautiful life and be kind to themselves in the process. I think that is so new. I mean, for me, it is, it's like, uh, yeah, let's do the ERP, but uh, what about your life, you know? Um, so I think that's that, that's wonderful that you're doing that. Okay, uh, I think we have about 10 more minutes and uh, you're going to have to come back. I hope you, you come back because I I'd love to. I, I appreciate you having me. <laughs> I will have um, a lot of, a lot more questions because they're already just uh, bubbling up. Um, cognitive diffusion. I wrote that down. I, I saw it in, I don't know where I saw it, 
but it had something to do with you. Maybe I saw it on your web page, but you're just all over the place. So um, what is cognitive diffusion? Good question. And I realize I never fully answered your question from before. Just to clarify, um, I mentioned exposure and response prevention and acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy <laughs> is um, also a branch of psychology that really considers you know, how our thoughts and emotions and behaviors are all interrelated. Um, exposure and response prevention is the branch of cognitive behavioral therapy for OCD. Okay. okay. Um, so that's kind of how they're all tied together and really, you know, act in exposure and response prevention. They come from the same parents. Um, they all come from this, this idea, uh, the, the cognitive behavioral therapy branch um, and all look at how, does, how do our thoughts and, and emotions influence what we do. Cognitive diffusion, the intervention that you just mentioned, is a diffusion is and it's a technique that's usually included in acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, okay, maybe that's yeah. What, okay, and so what we mean by cognitive um, diffusion is that sometimes you know when folks are having intrusive, unwanted thoughts, um, the thoughts really do feel so real and and, and unbelievable. And um, the mind is a really good salesperson. <laughs> like it's a really oh, good yeah. salesperson. It really wants you to believe that story. And when, when a person's in that sales mode, right? They're buying the story, they're believing the story. They're way more likely to act in, in line with the OCD. They're way more likely to engage in a compulsion. And so what we noticed in the research is that when people are able to step back from their thoughts, and kind of notice their thoughts as though it's like an experience they're having versus automatically buying and believing it, then they have a choice, right? Because they can then say, okay, you know, my mind or, you know, some people will name their OCD, right? Like Bert is now telling me that, um, you know, I harmed someone and I need to drive around the corner. And when people are able to step back and notice or their OCD or whatever they want to call it, they then have a choice, right? Around what do I want to do, right? Do I want to continue to buy the story that, that this salesperson is selling me right now and give in? Or do I want to, okay, notice it as my OCD and then choose a different path, maybe a path that gets me closer to my values? Right, which, which of course I keep bringing up the word uncertainty, but that that's kind of it what do you do with that and and so your workbook kind of addresses what you do with your life when you can sit back and make a choice right yes exactly exactly so that's a big part of it is being able to step back I mean the thing that a lot of different you know all the subtypes of OCD because there's many different subtypes and the thing that um, the subtypes all have in common is this underlying uncertainty, right? Is, is really not knowing um, if, if you are a certain way or not knowing if you're capable of having uncertainty or big emotions. And, um, you know, a part of what the different tools do, including diffusion, including mindfulness, including exposures, is it really helps people step back from their experience and help them motivate really to find out for themselves whether or not they're capable of handling these different experiences. And so, you know, one of my um, mentors, you know, had said to me, you know, rather than trust the mind, trust your experiences, right? And so we don't really like know that. what you're- I like that. Yeah, I, I like love that, that too. Cause you don't really know what you're capable of unless you're willing to try and see for yourself. Well, thank God for you because, um, I, and we're going to have to end it pretty quickly, unfortunately, today, just today, but you're invited back, of course. Um, but when I, I was so misdiagnosed, I don't know if, if people have to go through that a whole lot anymore, but people thought I had bipolar, people thought I was psychotic, people thought I was anything no one even mentioned OCD uh, up until I was at least 40 now I'm from the south but I mean they had psychiatrists I saw them uh, that just seems so strange to me that no one ever recognized it 
Well, and unfortunately, your story is all too common. Um, there has oh. been a little research done. Yeah, um, the um, International OCD Foundation actually talks about a statistic where, um, you know, on average, it takes between 14 and 17 years I read for folks. Something. Yes, I think. I yeah, read. to get a proper diagnosis and to get connected to effective care. And that's a whole lot of suffering. Oh, oh, that's it a is. whole it lot of suffering, a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, a big passion of mine is sharing information, doing things like being on this podcast. I also provide a lot of consultation and teach other therapists how to identify and help. I think it's with so OCD. wonderful that you do that. That and, and I hope you get a chance to talk to teachers because mm. I say I saw kids with OCD and I don't think anyone else did. But I, you know, I did what I could. Um, uh, so after we leave here, I will leave several ways that people can get in touch with you. But the best way is what? Yeah, you can check out um, our website, choicetherapy.net and email info at choicetherapy.net. Um, you know, our website will give you a glance of our team and the work that we do. And emailing info at choicetherapy.net will connect you to our wonderful assistant who can then um, get you scheduled. <laughs> she, she is. is she, will, um, she will get you connected to one of our team members. Great. And um, I'm doing a little, it, it's mostly to do with acting, but I have even found some OCD groups on Clubhouse. I don't know if you or your assistant have access to that at all but there are quite a few OCD groups on Clubhouse mm -hmm. and I, I'm just going to end this um, and I don't know why but most of these groups and I think maybe you and I touched on this when we first talked most of these groups are filled with people from the country of India and I again I don't know whether that's a cultural thing or what Maybe it's a shame thing that they can't discuss it with their family or with, I, I, I don't know. But I, I find that very interesting. It's not just people from India, but it's may, but the ones from India are male. And it's just mm. interesting to me. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not on, on Clubhouse. And unfortunately, you know, um, we're starting to get more information cross-culturally and understanding what OCD looks like cross-culturally, but it's still fairly limited. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And that's why I know uh, there's everything on Clubhouse, the good, the bad and the ugly, but but you would be the good. And uh, it's a it's becoming a big network tool and people need facts. And there's there's yeah. very what I think are very few really good rooms on Clubhouse. So maybe your assistant can you know, find out if you guys even belong there, but you're, you're so knowledgeable and you're so kind. And, and I think kindness is just, it's so important to me. And I'm sure to, to many, many other people. I've heard people say in the entertainment industry that you can be as talented as um, Marlon Brando, but if you are, excuse my French, an asshole, no one wants to work with you. And guess what? No one probably will. Um, so kindness and compassion is just way up there. And, and I can't wait to get your workbook. We're going mm -hmm. to shut it down for now, but um, I'm just delighted to have had you. And uh, Marisa, please come back. We will talk again. I'm more than happy to. And thank you again for, for having me. And I'm happy to talk more, more with I'm you. I'm going to have all these questions House. from my listeners. So I'm going to direct them to you, even okay. though they, they do know how to direct them to you. Sure. Um, and have a wonderful time in Florida. Did you bring your little one? Yes, uh, yes, he's, he's here. He just ran into the room for a second. My husband had to grab him real quick. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you so much. Okay, See thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.